Why is it? Why is it that what I read in here and what I do out there is opposite? I know what I want to do. I read the Bible. I'm pumped. I've got it down. I've got the program with God. But then at the end of the day, I come back and I can't even remember what I was supposed to do. And what I do know is what I was not supposed to do. Am I the only one? Anyone else who followed Christ for a long time who realized what the heck? God? Did I miss it somewhere at the beginning? Should I recommit my life? Should I say, Lord, forgive my sin again? This is where we're at in the book of Romans. We've been up the mountain. We've understood the gospel of grace and truth. Paul takes 11 chapters to explain the gospel to us, that there's now no condemnation, that uh, we have been forgiven freely. Sin is no longer something accounted or accredited to us. We are free by the grace of God. We get to the top of the mountain and it's just the most amazing view. We look out and say, wow, God, you're so fantastic. Thank you. And then we hit Romans 11. And we heard from Danny Hillman a couple of weeks ago, the biggest therefore in the Bible. Do you know when the Bible says therefore, it's because it's just told you something that you've got to apply to your life. And 11 chapters, Paul explains the gospel and we all receive it. And then he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, in view of these 11 chapters, in view of the gospel of grace, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. There's a response to the gospel. There's a therefore. There's an offering of our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be renewed by the transforming of your minds. And friends, that's the answer to our frustration. When we get to the end of the day and we say, God, I knew what I was supposed to do, but I just didn't do it, and I'm so frustrated. What's the problem? He says, how's the renewing of your mind going? How is your living sacrifice going? How is the conforming to the pattern of the world not going? And then unity helped us the next week by saying, guys, let's not have a too higher, let's have a sober judgment of ourselves. Let's not think of ourselves too higher than we ought. But in humility, let us love one another. Let us seek how we can serve one another in the body of Christ. Let us extend the same love that Christ has shown us to those in the body of Christ. And Barry last week showed us incredibly the outworking of that. I loved it that he said, God has always loved us in the first 11 chapters with agape love, the love that we receive from God. But now he wants us to take that love and love one another, friendship love called phileo. And he gave us these 12 categories of how we love with phileo love to one another. It should be there on the screen, 12, the 12 categories of phileo love. Sincerity, affection, enthusiasm, generosity, goodwill, discernment, honor, patience, hospitality, sympathy, humility. This is how Romans 12 exhorts us to love one another. This is within the church. But what about out there? Yes, we're supposed to love one another exactly the same. That's easy. Sometimes. There's a motivation because they're on our side. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes they're our own family members, our blood. What about our enemies? What about those who persecute us or attack us? What about those we don't even like? It's like, Lord, you call me to love this person. I don't even like them. 
That's what Paul comes to in these final four verses of Romans 12. As I said in the clip that some of you may have watched, going downhill is sometimes harder than going up. The runners or the mountain climbers will say, you're going up, it's okay, you, you get there. But when you come down, there's this jarring. If you've got weak knees, it, it, it really hurts. And sometimes even the descent of the devotion going down is harder. And these verses have got to be some of the hardest in Scripture to apply. I'm going to read them together, and then we're going to see and ask God to help us. Father God, we thank you that no Scripture in the Bible is there by mistake. We thank you that you inspired the Word of God, that you spoke to Paul and he wrote these verses. We ask as we go through them, you would help us, strengthen us, challenge us, convict us, but give us the grace and love of your Holy Spirit to outwork them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read Romans 12, and we're going to start at 14. I have those up. Because, and then our actual verses are 17 to 21, but 14 starts... Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is the Bible, by the way, NIV translation. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, You'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These have got to be some of the most radical words ever written. Definitely the most radical in the Bible. That if you look at them at face value, what it's asking us to do is to be completely opposite to our human nature, to ourselves. It's asking us to be completely different, of a different world, of a different spirit, of a different kingdom. Because exactly what it's asking us to do is exactly the opposite thing that we do when we are confronted and when we're persecuted. We live in a fallen world. In an evil world. Each one of us has a fallen nature. That was the problem. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each one of us sinners. And so when we act in these ways, when we retaliate, when we take revenge, when we slander, when we curse, it's our mother tongue. <laughs> it's just what we would do normally. If you don't believe me, watch children play. Because they come out fresh from the room, <laughs> room and womb, <laughs> in their human nature. One will take the toy, other one will say, I want it. And then there'll be a tussle. And then the weaker one will probably not be strong enough and let go. And the stronger one, with the toy, becomes a weapon, and he hits him with it. And then the other one cries, and before mom gets there, he's also looking for another weapon to fight back. And you think, are these my children? God? Said, yes, they're a mirror image of you. This is the challenge of these scriptures. But yet we're called to a different way. We're called to a different response. We're called to not conform to the pattern that is so natural to us. And our motivation and the benchmark for our change of life and our change of response can only come from one place. 
God. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has shown us and set the benchmark for how we love our enemies. Do you know where that was? A crazy wooden cross 2,000 something Chakuti years ago. A man hanging, bleeding, dying. The greatest illustration of loving your enemies the world has ever seen. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, we've already read it in this series. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But look at this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when I say enemies of God, do you think of yourself? Do you think of Hamas? God is a holy God. Those who sin and fall short of his glory. The Bible says you were enemies of God. Before you came to Christ, you were an enemy. In thought, word, and deed, the Anglicans say, we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have turned our backs on God. We have rebelled against him. We have dishonored him. We were his enemies. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At the very time we had offended God, at the very time we had uh, attacked him or dishonored him, the very time God had beef with us, he made a plan. He sent his son. He showed us love. And it's encapsulated in the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As Jesus uttered those words, dying for people that he created, people he loved, and yet people who crucified him, who spat at him, right through the ages, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This has got to be our motivation. This has got to be the benchmark in which we respond to our enemies. I love the quote from a professor in Yale University, a man called Miroslav Vlof. You may have never heard of him. He's a professor at Yale, but he's also been involved for years in dialogue between different cultures and different religions, prim uh, primarily Islam and Christian. He gets called in as the expert to negotiate and to speak about how it can work. And he sums up in these words, by suffering violence as an innocent victim, Jesus took upon himself the aggression of the persecutors. He broke the vicious cycle of violence by absorbing it and taking it upon himself. What we see in the world today is just a vicious cycle of violence. No one willing to concede. No one willing to take upon themselves. No one willing to be the first one to say, I'm sorry. Yet, Jesus took upon himself the aggression of the persecutors, broke the vicious cycle of violence by absorbing it and taking it upon himself. It was not fair. The gospel, the Bible, sorry, the crucifixion was unfair. Jesus' reputation was ruined. Everything he stood for in that time was diluted. It was unfair, but he took it upon himself. And friends, Romans 12, these verses speak to us about how do we take this gospel that we've received and apply it to our enemies to those who've hurt us, to those who hate us, to those who've been unfair. 
And there's great danger that we would be hypocrites. My own father said to me before he died, Andrew, I don't understand how people can say they love the Lord Jesus, but I've seen how they work in business. They're hypocrites. I don't know if my father gave his life to Christ or not. Because he looked at the church and he said, these guys are hypocrites. And we're in danger of realizing we're sinners. I'm falling short. I'm a sinner. I'm in trouble. I'm going to hell. Oh, thank you, God. Amazing. You died on the cross for me. You offer me salvation. You offer me forgiveness. I can go to heaven. Hallelujah. I'll go to church and raise my hands and sing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And then he says, what about your enemies? And you change. And you say, no way. It's not him. I'm going to get back at that guy. You don't mess with me, brother. I'll see you on Sunday. There's you, Jesus. That's the danger we face. And that's why Paul wrote, these verses. Jesus backs it up in Matthew 18. You can read it later, the parable of the unmerciful servant. <laughs> Offers so much to the king, cries out to the king for mercy. The, the king forgives him. The servant goes out and has his fellow servant arrested for a way smaller amount. So it's not just Paul's idea. <laughs> Jesus spoke about this in the Gospels. But Paul gives us these verses, 17 to 21. And he gives us a volley or a menu, a buffet of different phrases and exhortations to reprogram our response to how we respond to those who attack us. Like we said at the beginning, there's got to be a transforming of our minds and a, a reprogramming and a no longer conforming to the pattern of the world in how we response, respond. He first gives us four negatives. John Stott calls them negative imper imperatives. It's for the English teachers in the house. It's basically saying, don't do what you want to do. The very thing you think you should do at the moment, don't do it. Let's look at them. You can bring up those four. Verse 14, he says, do not curse. Cursing is essentially you speak negatively about somebody. Maybe you swear at them. Maybe you say, damn you. <laughs> Do you know damn you is the greatest curse you could ever say to a person? Essentially, it means God judge you and send you to hell, to damnation. Yet we so quickly say, damn you, cutting me off in traffic. That's the least you've done. You're in the right place because it gets way worse. <laughs> but he says, do not curse. Do not speak negatively. Do not judge the person. Call them names or slander them. You get home and you're speaking with your wife and you just say, you know, that person at work. I do it. Sometimes I offload to Samara and then at the end I think, how did that help me and how did that help the person's reputation? Do not curse. Do not repay evil for evil. The book of Hebrides 5.9. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Do unto others before they do it to you. That was a joke for the video. There's no book of Hebrides. But isn't that the pattern of the world that we're not conforming to? Dog eat dog out there. Do unto others before they do it to you. You hear people say he's a shock. Oh, he's a nice guy, he's got kids, but in the, in the office he's a shock. Hey, then you're, you're cursing the guy, you're judging the guy, and you're probably as sharky as him. <laughs> do not repay evil for evil. Do not take revenge Isn't that the first thing we want to do? Remember the kids in the playground? You hit me, I hit you. My daddy's bigger than your daddy. Do not become, do not be overcome by evil. Can I exhort us to apply these four things in the moment? 
I know God and the Holy Spirit would have already reminded you of a person <laughs> or a situation. It may have been years ago. It may have been in your family, maybe your parents or your siblings. Maybe a business deal that went wrong. Maybe worse, crime committed against you. I wish these weren't in the Bible. I wish it said retaliate. Get your revenge. Curse them. But it doesn't. Do not be overcome by evil. So the first application is, as it happens, remember these four things. Write them on your phone. Write them on your hand. If, if tattooing is right, do them on your wrist so you can quickly read. As that accident happens, as that person says something, as you feel that anger and that anxiety and just think it's not fair, it's not fair, Holy Spirit, remind us, do not curse. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not retaliate. Do not be overcome. I believe it's practical advice in the situation. Because so, so often how we react at the moment is what we regret later on. And you get home at the end of the day and say, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why couldn't I just kept kept quiet? So Paul gives us these four first aid principles in conflict. Do not, do not, do not, do not. But he doesn't leave us there. For every one of the do nots, he brings an application, uh, uh, do right or do the right thing or respond in this way. And sometimes they're harder than the actual do nots. And it's like, thanks, Paul. But for every do not, there's a positive outworking that re represents the kingdom of God. The first one, instead of curse, bless those who persecute you. Verse 14, bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. So friends, we're called in the moment and at the time that we are being attacked and persecuted to bless. As I thought about this and said, God, what does blessing look like? It's prayer. The greatest blessing you can give to a person is to pray for them. Do you know that? The Bible says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. It says that as well. It's again Jesus' words in the Gospels. So once we've got through the do nots, can I exhort us to pray for those who've hurt us? Pray for those who persecute you. We don't have tomatoes or eggs in church these days. <laughs> but if we did, I would be hiding behind the lectern now, waiting, waiting for people to start throwing me. But the part of the blessing is to pray. And you know what happens is as you pray for that person, Holy Spirit A begins to work in your heart. He changes your attitude towards them. And, funnily enough, works in their heart. No one is outside the gospel. No amount of evil person is far enough away that prayer for them cannot draw them back by the Holy Spirit. And that's why I believe Jesus says, pray for those who hurt you. Pray for those who persecute you. In all the evil attack, Jesus simply said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And another thing that's helped me with that is to recognize the work of the devil in the situation. All evil has its source in Satan, in the devil. Sometimes people who hurt us and attack us and have done horrible things to us, yes, they did it, yes, they were the ones, but often, I'm not saying they're possessed by demons and all of that, but you can look at it and say, the devil has done this. Remember, Joseph, you meant it for harm. The devil was at work. I'm not going to allow the offense to be personal, but recognize the work of the devil behind that. And if you walk in the shoes of many of the people that offend you, you actually begin to think, wow, they've also had such a bad day. They've had a rough day. They've, they've gone through some stuff. And you realize, wow, 
It's not actually them. It's the work of the devil. And it helps to pray for them. Do not repay evil for evil. Then he says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is so practical. Instead of repaying with evil, we seek reconciliation. It often requires forgiveness. Usually all the time. <laughs> but that requires sacrifice. What Jesus is asking us to do, what Paul is asking us to do is not easy. It requires great sacrifice. Somebody is going to lose in this situation. And often, it's us. Say, though you've harmed me, though you've attacked me, though you've stolen from me, I forgive you. And you know you're losing millions of dollars in the business deal that went wrong. That's why it's so difficult and so hard. We're called to do the opposite. Because you know, when we retaliate and when we do the things we want to do, it only escalates the violence. Because very seldom will you retaliate and attack and get revenge on a person and they'll say, oh, great, thanks. What do they do? They attack again. And you feel, oh, now this time I'm going big. Mm -hmm. And so it escalates. I haven't wanted to speak much about the Middle East at the moment because it's so difficult to work out exactly what's going on and it's been years. But all you see is we're going to get ourselves back and we're going to retaliate and we're going to retaliate and we don't mind how much it costs this time. We're going to eliminate. And you can just see that it's not going to end well. Do not take revenge. Sorry, I missed, but, but as long as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Can you look over your life and say, that person I don't have peace with? How many people are there in your life where you're saying, hmm, if I saw them in pick and pay today, I would dodge and go down the next aisle? I've got one. I've tried to live my life and say, I don't want to get to the end of my life and have any enemies. I want everyone to feel they can come to my funeral and everyone would be happy for me to go to their funeral. There's still one. I'm working on that. But we can't live with, ah, that person, that person. That's right. Harari is too small. You live in LA, maybe, that's fine. And the Christian circles in Harari, you're going to see that person next week. Better you reconcile now, otherwise you're going to be dodging every, t every time you go to pick and pay. Oh, another one, another one. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. I will repay, says the Lord. We cannot play God. We mustn't bring judgment. God says, I will repay. And it's possibly the hardest thing because you have to wait till judgment day. It's like, God, can't you see what they're doing? Can't you see the evil that they're getting away with in every single day? And you want me to wait till judgment day. Next week, we talk about the law courts and letting the justice system do its thing. There's a place for that in Zimbabwe. Rather refer to this one. <laughs> God will repay. <laughs> God will judge. Leave room for God's wrath. We are not called to play God. Yet, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Similar to blessing, we begin not only to wait to give room for God's wrath, but we look for ways to help and to bless our enemies through their physical needs. This is just ridiculous now. Come on. Over the top. By this you will burn burning coals upon their head. 
You know, you get excited about this because it's like, right, this is my judgment time. The way I get back at this person is bless them and serve them and love them because it's like pouring burning coals on their head. I will smite them. I will damn them. That will be the coals of hell on their head. Yeah. No. This illustration, <laughs> sorry guys, <laughs> refers to the purging of sin and cleansing and forgiveness that we see in Isaiah 9. Remember Isaiah, I'm an unclean man and my, lips, uh, my hands have shed innocent blood and my lips have spoken sin. And when God forgives him, the angel takes a burning coal from the fire and puts it on his lips and purges it and says your sins are forgiven. When the Bible asks us, to feed those who are hungry, give them a drink. By this you'll pour burning coals on their head. It's saying by these actions, by these incredible uh, actions of love towards the people that have hurt you, you open the door for the gospel and for forgiveness. And they say, if that person that I harmed so badly actually offers me this love, there must be something, uh, there must be a God. And the burning coals are the cleansing of sin. As we do these things, it opens up the possibility that these people would come to Christ. And finally, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what we're called to do. We're in this world, but not of it. God calls us to face evil and overcome it. You know, Christ has the copyright for grace and mercy and forgiveness. He's patented that. Only the church and believers have what it takes to be able to forgive, to be able to show grace, to be able to show forgiveness because we've received it ourselves. And that's what it is to overcome evil with good. And as we close, Romans 12, in view of God's mercy, the cross is our example. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Shall we pray? And as we pray, I want you to think of that person, of that situation, of that wrongdoing, of that hurt, of that harm, that broken relationship that crime against you. Holy Spirit, as we bring these things to mind before you, we ask that you would help us to not curse. Father God, help us not to retaliate or take revenge. Help us not to be overcome by this evil, but overcome the evil with good. <coughs> Heavenly Father, where we've already blown it, where we've already cursed and retaliated, where we've taken revenge and where we've been evil ourselves in the way we've reacted to the evil against us, we thank you for your grace and for your forgiveness. We thank you that you went to the cross for people such as us. We ask that you would help us going forward to respond in a different way, to no longer respond in the pattern of this world, that you would renew our minds, Lord Jesus, in the view of your mercy to us. That you would help us not to judge, not to take revenge, to leave room for God's wrath. Help us to speak blessing and life into people's lives, even though they've attacked us. Help us to do things. Give us ways and initiatives to bless people that burning coals may be poured on their head, that purge them of the evil and the difficulty and the sin in their lives. Would you open the door of salvation through our reaction in these situations? Thank you, Father. Help us to be different. In Jesus' name, amen.